um, kind of a hard stop. I have a hard stop, but for some reason, um, conversation needs to continue. I would just circle back with either Beck or Fred to update any minutes that I might miss. But I bet we can get this completed. All right, you are recording. Great, well, uh, let's call to order the uh, City of Port Orchard's Economic Development and Tourism Committee meeting. Today's October 26th, and uh, just a few minutes after eight o'clock. Um, Typically, we start off with the business community discussion. I'm seeing that none of our business community members are present here this morning, but I would ask either Fred, Beck, or anyone else here present in the meeting if you're hearing any updates from the community, um, how things are going. I know since our last meeting, um, some of our restrictions um, were kind of eased a little bit. We're, we're allowed to have certain types of meetings now, which we weren't you know, able to host before. And uh, also we have the ability to now dine indoors uh, with table sizes up to six people. And those six people do not need to be from the same household. So I know that's helpful for our local restaurants as we move into you know, our winter season and lose the ability to dine outdoors because the weather's not very good. So any other comments, Fred, Beck, that you're hearing out there? Any concerns that we should be aware of? I don't have anything to add. I haven't heard anything new. Okay. No. Great. Okay. Well, look. there are some particular segments of um, our business community that are doing quite well. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Which is evident when we see our sales tax reports that we just uh, saw the other day, which is great. Okay, um, originally on, on the agenda number two, we were going to get an update on the South Kitsap Community Event Center, but that actually came in front of the full city council at last Tuesday's meeting. And so we will strike that discussion from, from here. And uh, we will now move straight to our third item in the agenda, which is the downtown county, county campus sub area plan. Over to you, Nick. All right. Um... So we are getting close to a public release on the downtown county campus sub area plan. And Carrie, when we put this on the agenda, I can't remember what all we intended to share. Um, the I think that we've sent you a link so that you could review just the draft plan that includes some conceptual drawings and um, just kind of a, a really rough preliminary draft of that plan. Um, just to let you know what was in there and what was um, what was being proposed at this time. And so I don't have anything specific that I wanted to cover today. It was just mostly a chance to discuss what was provided to you uh, if you had any questions. I know there were a, quite a few typos in there and we've we've already gone through and done a technical edit of the document and given them that feedback. Um, we are also going to be meeting um, with uh, Mr. Titus here soon to talk to him as one of the key property owners in the downtown. Um, the, uh, we're, we're coordinating with the sewer lift station project, which from June when we started our, our planning effort to now that plan has changed somewhat. And so it's important to make sure that our consultant is capturing the, the latest and greatest on the sewer side of things for the Marina lift station. We've been working with the county and making sure that their plans are sort of incorporated into the sub area plan. Um, and then of course the community event center is, is also being um, incorporated into this. And so the hope is that by the time we have a final decision on the site selection, we can make sure that that is reflected in the sub area plan as well. Um, so I, I, I think we have a, pro a major problem here because I've got business people, the link that's on our agenda is bad. And um, <laughs> If the one in my calendar actually worked, I couldn't get into the meeting. And Matt Murphy's saying he that he's having the same issue. He's off on another. And he says the meeting's already in. In uh, so I'm going to forward him the link. So um, and then I'll forward it to Samantha Evans too. I hope. So while you're doing that, Mayor Nick and Carrie. I don't remember seeing the link uh, to that downtown sub area plan. Could you? either resend it or let me know when you did send it to us. Okay, can you handle that one? And I looked at it briefly. Um, was there anything that we needed to look at? Because I saw a lot of empty blank pages and I know it's it's a preliminary draft as, as you said, Nick. Um, 
No, I don't think so. I think my biggest concern with some of the conceptual planning areas, specifically for the West downtown and then the West Bay Blackjack Creek area, was I was concerned that what they were showing didn't match with our shoreline master program. But we actually had a really productive meeting with the, the Department of Ecology and they're they're very excited that we're doing this sub area plan and they pointed us in uh, some directions about um, I, I mentioned at the council meeting concerning the community event center that we could actually reduce setbacks to 25 feet for water enjoyment uses. And so I think we have um, we, we've sort of covered that topic with ecology and are going to make sure as part of our shoreline master program update that everything in this sub area plan is is viable and can be done pursuant to the shoreline regulations. So um, I know that you know, there were some some new development shown that was really oriented towards the water and actually had the drive aisle on the water side of the building. And the, what Mitch explained, Mitch is our consultant with GGLO, is that he really wants the front of businesses facing the water. And in order to do that, you have to provide access to the front of the business. And so it, it's a way of, of kind of this this idea of flipping portions of the, the waterfront so that they're oriented towards the water rather than having their backs to the water. And once Misty Blair at Ecology heard that, I think she was she was really open to the idea and you know seemed kind of excited about the planning that we're doing. Good. Okay. Do you have kind of a you know general timeline just you know from here forward, kind of how this is going to play out, Nick? I know it's it's not going to be exact, but just well, we're on a pretty strict schedule, so um, we have to have this adopted by April first, so that and we can close the grant out by June. 30th of next year. Okay. Um, we're planning on taking the preliminary draft plan to the full council work study in November. So in another uh, three or four weeks, you will see uh, the entire thing for a public release and public comment on that document. And the, the uh, preliminary EIS will be released around that same time. And that will open the comment period for the environmental impact statement. Um, and then once we go through that public outreach process, public comment period, um, they will finalize the documents so that we can adopt them. And we're hoping to have this mostly wrapped up in January or February. Okay. And then it's just a matter of taking it through our adoption process by June. Okay, perfect. Good morning, Matt. We apologize for the confusion on the, uh, the multiple links there. So happy that we've got that resolved and, and you're present. Um, we you. did brief we did briefly start with just kind of that general business community discussion that we typically do at all of our meetings. Um, just asking this committee if we're hearing anything from our from our local business owners, either on a, you know, on a positive front or a negative front. We really didn't have anything um, from the rest of the community this morning. Did you want to revert back to business or that kind of discussion? Is there anything you wanted to, to add to that that conversation, Matt? Well, I'm just. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. I'm just excited that uh, 2020 is almost over with, and um, <laughs> hopefully we can uh, we can roll into 2021 with uh, a fresh face. But I do know that uh, we are working to, uh, with Pabza and putting together a home for the hometown, uh, home for the holidays uh, um, kind of handbook, and and trying to continue to promote shopping local. That's about all we can do. Um, and uh, like I said, as soon as we can turn the calendar over, hopefully things will be a little bit better. Absolutely. And we did highlight that since our last meeting that um, restrictions were loosened, like for restaurants where now people uh, up to yeah. table size of six could, could dine indoors without having to be from the same household. Rob, yeah. you had a question? I just want to, uh, now that I'm not calling people and email and I, I had something to add here too, is that, you know, we, the third phase of our CARES uh, rent relief uh, is being processed right now it was the largest of the three groups and um as a result finance was also working very hard on the budget so i was hoping that i was going to get all of those checks i think there's 13 of them in this group i'll have about two-thirds of them uh tomorrow afternoon that uh, they'll go out I'll, i'm going to hand deliver three or four of them is about all i got time to do and the remaining third will be processed next Tuesday. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, commerce has this criteria and, uh, you know, it's, we were just a lot, a lot of people have to touch this that stuff before we, these $5,000 checks. So, uh, and there's Gary Anderson. So maybe we, you want to ask that same question to Gary. <laughs> and I, I do have one other question, uh, one other thing, Sean. 
um, the uh, fence around the uh, old, uh, um, I don't know where, Jor where Jordan's was or across from Josephine's. Yep. I know that it, it went up with demo and it was part of the permit that that uh, fence could stay up for a certain amount of time. I don't know, uh, Nick, if, if that timeline was extended, um, but um, I thought they had like six months or something like that to get that fence down. Um, and uh, here we are a, a, a year after demo, I think, and it's still up and still in a, a blight on downtown. So I don't know what the situation with that is. Well, um, I have not looked at that issue for some time. I don't remember what their approval said, so I'll have to look at it and get back to you. Thank you. We have a meeting with uh, the bank here in the near future. I can raise that uh, during that meeting potentially. Great comment, Matt. Thank you for that. Okay, hey Gary, welcome. Good to see Hi, you. Hopefully you didn't get confused by our multiple uh, Zoom links here this morning. We apologize if, if you did. I think um, that was the confusion. I started with an earlier link and I couldn't get in, so. Yeah, yeah. No, that was not that was not on you. Um, Gary, we just kind of completed talking about, uh, like we do every meeting, just general information, feedback from the community. Um, we didn't have a whole lot to, to really discuss. Didn't hear too many new things since our last meeting. Did you have anything for, for that conversation? Um, right, right off the top of my head, no. Okay. Um, so if something occurs to me later on, I'll, I'll bring it up. Perfect. And then we did have a short discussion. We're kind of skipping around the agenda here a little bit. Item number three with the downtown county campus sub area plan. Um, Nick just provided an update kind of on, on what that process looks like. This is something that needs to be done um, by the April 1st so we can conclude that grant in June. So there'll be more coming. Um, this is actually will be a presentation in front of the full uh, work study of the council in November. So just more of an update on, on really calendaring this. So Okay. Um, we will continue down the agenda. We did skip over item number two, Matt and Gary. Um, this, this, we were originally planning to have this at this committee um, before we had to postpone this meeting. And so this actually went to the full council last Tuesday. And so we don't need to have the repeat discussion on that today. So now we're going to move on to item number four. Um, and Rob and Mark uh, talking about the use of public space during COVID-19. And uh, not, so if I may, um, Samantha Smith is really the one driving this uh, owner of Josephine's and I wish she could have been here this morning. I just called her and um, I got her voicemail. So um, unfortunately, you know, historically, we've had, we've got a handful of what, are, what we call grandfathered events that we support with public resources, public works, putting up the signs, the police providing traffic control. And with COVID, those historic events aren't happening. Uh, and we're seeing other communities do unique things with, with their right of the way and their sidewalks. And our sidewalks probably aren't wide enough to do much with, but maybe we need to be considering during COVID, you know, making COVID exceptions for other events versus what, what Samantha brought forward an application um, for a couple of weekends to close Frederick Street. And the, the process uh, from a traffic control standpoint, and I, I don't think we need to have anybody flagging traffic out there from the police department, but it just got beyond her skill set and what she was able to do to, for, to you know, add that um, additional retail space outside. And winter's coming. Um, I think the opportunities to take advantage of this are diminishing and I'm hopeful in the spring that COVID's behind us, but if it's not, and we're still not doing these other big events, should we be doing more with our right of ways and open space to help our existing businesses? So that's really the discussion. Yeah. Go ahead, Beck. Well, I would just say um, I support some of what the mayor said. Um, I do believe that we could be using our public space. Um, I'm, the applications that I saw appeared to me we were closing 
a road and we were doing it not for a couple of weekends, but um, regularly during the month of October and some in September. And my thought was I have no problem with um, businesses needing to take some of their retail outside, but I'm wondering if rather than closing an entire street, they can just use the parking area. Um, I'm thinking Frederick's is a one-way street going north and it's got parking on both sides. So we could still have a travel lane for our general public going north and we could have the west side parking still there. And perhaps that business could make use of the parking area along Fred's, Frederick's. Um, there's also a lot of parking space behind that building. I think we need, as Sean, you said last time, I think we need to be creative in helping people, uh, helping the business yeah. be successful. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that closing a city street um, every Saturday for a couple of months is appropriate either. So I think there's somewhere in the middle, I think is a solution for everyone. Yeah, no, I, I would tend to agree with that. I know there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to this, a lot of concerns, liability, and you know the, the public gifting of dollars. And but I think you know during these COVID times, I, I would hope that we could come together, like you said, back and, and find a creative solution that isn't necessarily ongoing and every weekend. But if we can help our local business community, it'd be it'd be great to try to find a way to get to yes. Yeah, and and public works isn't trying to be say no. I just want to make sure that there aren't gifting issues because um, that whole grandfathered thing's pretty arbitrary. Um, and now, but this wasn't a grandfathered event. And my, my big concern wasn't, it was closing the road because that's a main road to get to the marina and that marina loop um, to close that road. But it was getting out onto 166 to close off that turn line. And so, now we're getting our public works crews out there doing that work and closing that lane off routinely. So it was the closing of the road that was the issue. And are we going to continue to expend public resources for a non-grandfathered event? And I was just wanting clarification on that. We'll do whatever you guys want to do. I just, that's not up to me to make that decision. We, the good news is we have a street use permit process now that we didn't have three or four years ago. So we do have the appropriate process that isn't a right of way permit. It's a street use, but you know, this, this yeah, I was, I was just going to add that, you know, these are probably, you know, individual conversations. It's probably going to be pretty hard for the council to come up with some sort of a policy that's going to cover, you know, everything all the time, you know, this is unique. And I think the next one's going to be unique. And so maybe, maybe what we do is loop back with, with Samantha, Rob, um, mm -hmm. Like I said, some of these dates have already passed and just maybe get an idea of what she's thinking, you know, if this is now going to be bumped to spring, um, you know, just, I guess, just reopen the conversation and see what we can do. So I, I, I'm gathering there's a less of a desire to completely close the street. If we could take half the street and then use the parking on the other side as the travel lane, you know, is that what I'm hearing? Is we need to space between pedestrians and and people shopping and people driving down the road i think i think it's safer to close the street altogether but if if that's yeah. desire not to do that then then we probably need to eliminate the parking there at least and driving in the parking lane which then that's a bigger exercise on public works part to right. cone off an area versus closing it what I heard Beck say was to use the parking in front of the old swim deck as parking, keep the road open, and the event only goes into the parking that's fronting the building. That yeah. was that was my idea, what I had suggested. Or again, we have a there's a lot of parking space behind her building that maybe her, her and I talked about that it doesn't have the visibility that Bay Street does. That that well, was a that's a different issue. Yeah. yeah. Again, I think I think we can come up with a creative solution that meets everyone's needs. I, I'm concerned about cars backing out of those parking stalls into 
the shopping area. I, I, I we we either close it or or we don't. I don't think we yeah. do it that way. I but, tend to agree with that. There's that's a, yeah. seems to be a lot more work too, and mm-hmm. there's not that much traffic on Frederick Street, especially in our shoulder seasons. That you know, if this isn't yeah. ongoing yeah. every single weekend, if this is maybe a special event, that that maybe that's the the win win. Well, just remember that is because I still live down in that marina. That is the main entrance where people go in to get to that marina parking. So it's one, it's one of it's one of three spots, Mark. Yeah. So again, my my bigger issue is, and I think both the chief and I, at some point, we're going to need direction from the council on this grandfathered issue. You know, are, are we going to expand the grandfathered events? Um, oh, Mark, that isn't the intent at all. It, it is. This is something related to COVID, and right, we're not doing the other things. So, and I have emergency powers I could I could use. I just don't like to use them without. Uh, I still have to bring that that back to the to the council. And so let's let's get out in front of this a little bit. And I think we've got a little direction. Matt, you raised your hand. I... So. Um... You know, something that I found with a lot of other businesses and, and Sean, you may have experienced it too, you know, is that a lot of money that wasn't, that was, that was budgeted in other places hasn't been spent. For example, you know, real estate offices aren't advertising their open houses and, and the newspaper as much, especially mm-hmm. now since it doesn't exist in South Kitsap. But since, you know, Fathoms didn't happen, Chimes and Lights isn't closing the road. I don't know that the budget is being stretched any further by, um, you know, public works closing Fredericks as opposed as opposed to closing the entire Highway 160 and stuff like that. So um, these are all monies that have that have already been budgeted, and to close the street is not that big a deal. Um, remember, it used to be closed every weekend for Farmers Market a while back. Um, so I would encourage that you know it is an opportunity to help the local businesses, and all it would really entail is putting down a few signs, I think. Um, so. Yeah, and Matt, I think I think everyone's in agreement on that. The concern I think that, that, that Mark's bringing up is this just whole idea of public gifting of funds, you know, and I think the way that RCW is written, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but if there are those types of costs and those costs should be passed on to the, to the organization that's doing it. Um, so that's what we're trying to figure out. Can through these like emergency powers of the mayors or a way that we can get around that? Because if we had to charge a small business three, four, even five hundred dollars, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but that's going to eat it away at a hundred percent of their margins on anything they may sell that that time frame, right? So it's it's kind of a non-starter for a small business, even if they have to pay a few hundred dollars. So that's that's kind of what we're trying to work around. Mark, did I phrase that appropriately? Yeah, it isn't. It isn't that we have budget. It's it's more the question that no one might ask is, can I actually, you know, can this be a a, a legally reimbursable, right. you know, reimbursable? Or can we charge public works or police time to that event? And we got around it in the past with the grandfathering clause, um, but again, this one was outside that. Yeah. I, mean, I think we have a path forward. I'd just I, like to add that I, I understand the, the concern about the public gifting. However, closing Frederick Street is not a new phenomenon. Dave um, used to do it for Swim Deck. And somehow that happened for his Oktoberfest thingy. And, you know, that it has happened. It's a small segment of if there are other ways for cars to get into the marina. They can go through the Kitsap Bank entrance. So it's, it's not like this has never been done before. Right. We, it was closed for the act of prescription as before we had the street use permit process. And he was he was required to get approval from everybody in the downtown. He did a the, poor job, I know. Yeah. So I, I think I've got some direction here yeah. of what I need to do. Charlie gets back from vacation tomorrow. And I'll check in with Charlie and how we can draft some sort of a COVID order that allows us some some uh temporary a temporary relaxing of the uh the standards that will you know allow us to use public resources for this to, to set up sign i don't think any of these activities require um police flag and traffic and i think that's that's a step beyond what anybody's talked to me about it's putting out signs and, and closing a street or a parking area and uh i think i got a, i got enough 
direction here that I think I can, um, Charlie and I can work on something and bring it back to you guys. Again, Mayor, I just want to emphasize that I think the frequency will be um, an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, occasional use. Yep. Okay, well, thanks everyone for adding to that conversation. Let's move on to item number five here, the discussion of the Shoreline Master Program. Um, update draft SMP and uh, the revisions addressing sea level rise. Nick. And Carrie, do you want to speak to this topic in terms of where we're at? Sure. Um, the the code the proposed code revisions that you see in front of you are in response to the sea level rise report that was prepared by our consultant which was provided to council and you reviewed several weeks ago. Um, they gave a presentation on that. Um, these have been reviewed both by our consultant and by Ecology um, for their approval. And they, they will hopefully be incorporated into our shoreline master program if council approves them um, next year. And so what we've done, as you see, these are in um, strikeout underline, um, they will be going into our existing SMP code and also into our flood management regulations, which are in title 20. Um, we're proposing some new definitions for coastal flood elevation, coastal flood hazard area, channel migration zone, and freeboard. These are things that we did not have um, in our plan right now, but we need them to address the additional regulations that are being proposed. Um, the consultant, this is number one, the consultant had re recommended that we designate um, our entire marine shoreline as a coastal high hazard area for a number of reasons due to the frequency of coastal flooding, the fact that nearly all of our um, downtown shoreline is on fill and the risk of tsunamis. And so what we've done is in um, number one, number two, this is on page two, we have two proposed code revisions for flood damage prevention and coastal high hazard areas where we have designated all of our marine shorelines, which would include all of S Sinclair Inlet um, and then the tidal estuarine portion of Blackjack Creek as a coastal high hazard area. And so that is, that is also, um, that's, this is in, PM, in Title 20, flood damage prevention and the coastal high hazard areas section, which is already in our code. So we have adopted our, our consultant's recommendation there. Um, on page four, we have formally adopted um, the, federal, the federal government's 2017 flood insurance rate mapping, their maps um, for special flood, flood hazard. Um, that's just something that we should have done a couple of years ago, we did not do. So that just brings us up to date on the most current flood insurance maps. Um, on page five, they had, the consultant had recommended that we revise our coastal flood hazard regulations to just be consistent with removing and discouraging non-water dependent development, including redevelopment from areas lying at or below the 100 year coastal flood elevation. And where necessary that we would have to be um, adding freeboard to existing shore armor, um, building structures at new and higher elevations, basically just acknowledging that we, we have flooding problems already and that we are likely to be having more and greater flooding problems in future due to sea level rise. And so we are um, going to be requiring existing structural armoring in future and we will be moving um, structures landward in future. This also requires, as you see at the bottom of page five, that the creation of new lots or tracks that are within these coastal flood hazard areas should not be allowed unless they are for the purpose of ecological restoration or development setback. So that will be, in, that's a new item. Um, another thing, this is on page, uh, page six, another thing that our consultant had recommended was that uh, this would be for the use of the public and for developers that we should create and maintain a coastal flood hazard map which shows our base 100 year coastal flood elevation um, and includes a future projection of additional areas that have at least a 50% probability of being flooded within 20 years, or in other words, within our SMPs planning timeframe. And that would be a, uh, based, based on our best available science and would be updated each time that we update our SMP. So we will adopt that into our SMP and create that map and maintain it. Um, and we will also, uh, um, 
evaluate our coastal flood hazard reduction policies and development regulations every time that we go through our SMP and keep those updated as well. The consultant had also recommended that we add more of the pollution abatement function of marine riparian areas, the vegetation that are in marine riparian areas, and that this would be especially helpful for pollution control along the paved parking lots that we have adjacent to the marine shoreline. So we added a section for that, that's at the bottom of page six, that when we do um, restoration of shoreline, um, that we would also look at aquatic vegetation in mitigation restoration plans in storyline man in, in stor stormwater management where that is feasible. Um, contaminated sediments along the, the shoreline were also of concern to our consultant. Um, they were aware that there are a number of areas along our shoreline that have historical uh, areas of contaminated sediments which are in danger at this point and in the near future of having their locations breached due to, con due to continued um, saltwater intrusion and future flooding due to sea level rise. And they were quite concerned that we have no plan in place to address that. And so we have adopted or we are proposing to adopt new policies and regulations that say that we will be mapping all of the shoreline locations in which there are known contaminated sediments and developing a long-term plan to evaluate and address those in need of attention that are at risk of mobilization. As flooding comes in, those contaminated areas will be mobilized, the sediments will spread out and um, spread contamination into other areas. So we actually need to, we, we need to become aware of those and address those now. Um, and we need to adopt that both as a policy in our SMP and we need to start doing that as part of our shoreline permit application review process. So we will need to adopt a process for reviewing those for requiring applicants to um, determine and disclose whether sediment material is on the development site and to um, require remediation to prevent the spread of contamination. So those two are on um, page seven. And then the consultant had also recommended that we create new standards for downtown waterfront redevelopment based on the design lifetimes. That we, could that we would expect to see based on sea level rise. And so if someone is proposing to do development right down, right on the waterfront, that we would say, well, you know, based on projected sea level rise, if you're going to do this, we need to see that you have a certain amount of free board or a certain amount of elevation. We need to have that in our SMP standards and in our development standards in our code. It, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be specific, um, necessarily in, in, in one section or another. Uh, it probably would be going into Title 20 zoning, but it also should be in our shoreline master program so that we're addressing the hazards that could be coming up over the 20 year planning period. We just need to make sure that we have sufficient elevation basically, as well as making people aware of the risks of developing right on the shoreline with the risk of sea level rise and to make sure that we are um, requiring sufficient design to protect both the developer and the public from the risks of sea level rise and coastal high hazards. So that is a very short and quick summary of the proposed changes to our SMP. And this is just one section of the proposed SMP update, by the way, this is just addressing sea level rise. There are still a number of other updates that, that we're going to be proposing as we go through this process, but this was the one issue that had not been addressed before in previous updates. And it was something that Ecology was really recommending that we and other jurisdictions look at at this time. So this is the one thing that we had hired a consultant for um, to do best available science and recommendations. So this was done as one package um, that will be part of a larger overall package. And we just wanted to take this through um, as one subject and have the, the council review it as one subject and, and look at these recommendations standalone before we moved on to another issue. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to go through them. I do. Maybe just go ahead, Gary. I don't, I don't have a copy of this, um, but I'd like to read it through. I did get a letter suggesting that there was going to be some code changes uh, uh, reviewed or considered, but um, if I could get a copy of that, I'd like to see it. Sure. And, um, I'm glad you got the letter because that reminds me, I wanted to mention 
we we mailed um, we mailed out a letter, which that sounds like the letter you got to about between 800 and 900 uh, property and business owners, everyone on the shoreline and up the Blackjack Creek estuary, of um, the sea level rise report and then these dr these draft code changes because we did want everybody who has either a property or a business on the shoreline to be aware of this, that 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 report is out, um, and that we are proposing these changes and that there will be multiple opportunities. Um, before the planning commission and before city council to review and to um, comment, ask questions, express concerns and propose additional changes. And so I'm glad to hear that you got yours because we were having some problems with mail delivery. So yeah. these are available online, but Gary, I will send you yours in an email separately. Okay, um, who, who was the consultant and where'd you find them? Herrera Environmental and um, Cascadia Consulting is who prepared a sea level rise report and other um, climate adaptation changes report for Kitsap County last year. They did all entire Kitsap County. Herrera was the sub consultant who specifically focused on sea level rise. And so when they concluded um, the, the umbrella report for Kitsap County, we took them and had them write a more specific targeted report for Port Orchard shoreline. Hmm. Okay. I, I mean, I think we can all acknowledge that we currently flood, and, and any if we as we're redeveloping our downtown, one, you can't build buildings today as close as to the shoreline as you used to, and when these new buildings get built, that they need to be probably higher uh, by a, a foot or two, and or things need to be done around the building to um, combat the existing condition, let alone what, you know, what uh, science is saying is, is going to happen, you know, to our world. And, and um, is, Gary, the, uh, we do have this, if you go to the Department of Community Development website, on the left-hand side, there's a link to the 2019 to 2021 uh, Shoreline Master Program periodic update. And so this document, as well as the uh, base documents, are all on that city website. Okay. Thank you. Do we Rob, know is what this map is going to look like? Uh, the map on page two of the coastal high hazard area. Um, it mentions like 200 feet landward from ordinary high water. Do is that map part of the report that's online? That's actually our entire shoreline jurisdiction zone right now, and so nothing changes with that. That map is already online and we're just saying that our existing shoreline jurisdiction is a coastal high hazard area. Rob, I just going to make a comment that, you know, is this kind of informing, generally speaking, the, the site selection process with the community event center? And is this just at least being considered? Um, Yes. It isn't part of our, yes and no. It isn't part of our criteria, but any site, any of those sites are affected by this and we'll right. have to do things when when the new buildings are built to, right. to combat this. Because I, I mean, we, I have, we have street and land that floods currently, you know, Ooh. two, three times a year right now, um, which is- yeah, flood mapping that was done is part of the site constraints analysis that was done by the civil engineer that, that Rice Fergus Miller hired. So Perfect. they have looked at all three sites in the context of probable sea level rise and understand that on each site, uh, building the building has to be elevated. Right. A, a question I have is, um, I know that we have um, permit applications in now for properties that will fall within this and how will they be affected next? Well, if a permit is in, they are vested to our current code. So we can make them aware of this and they can choose to comply. But until this is adopted, um, only applications submitted after adoption have to comply with this new standard. So Nick, just for clarification, you're talking about actual permits. So the Bay Street pedestrian path, I guess I have a concern that we've gone through that complete NEPA ECS process, but we're not at the point of actually having the construction permit issue. That project is not intended to mitigate or deal contemplate sea level rise at all. In fact, the recent NEPA update 
addressed it in that particular fashion. So how am I going to yeah, get around? This applies to buildings. So a pedestrian pathway doesn't have to be elevated in the same way that a building does. Okay, just want to make sure because it will have some piling in the cantilevered portions. So it'll have structural elements. We're not, so, we're not rebuilding our roads and our pathways for this, it's, it's buildings. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So we might still have water in our roads. Or yeah, our I mean, with that, with that said though, I mean, you're, the final design of any cantilevered portion of the pathway needs to consider that it could be subjected to wave action and other energy. I mean, um, <laughs> just make sure the engineer is aware of this. Okay, any other comments on the uh, sea level rise issue? Well, I'm just, I'm wondering what the added cost will be, which is probably in some mind somewhat irrelevant. If you if you don't build a building right and it gets ripped down because of wave action, then then you made a mistake not doing it right. But I'm, I'm wondering what the added cost will be for complying with the requirements. Well, the cost of elevating a building is something that's going to vary from site to site, um, depending on, on how high you have to elevate something. Um, I believe, though, the flood insurance, um, I, I don't know if this changes actually the flood insurance mapping for the city, Carrie. Do you, is where we adopt the new 2017 map, is it that all properties in that area then also have to carry flood insurance or is that a separate issue altogether? That's a separate issue altogether. We're just formally adopting that mapping. Um, okay, because so that they're already paying flood insurance because the map yeah, exists correct. at the federal level. I mean, and, and, <clears throat> and I would argue, Gary, um, um, how desirable is a building that you have to sandbag and floods three times a year versus one that doesn't uh, on the ground. The retail. I understand that you know doing it right is is important, but at, at the same time, uh, it's it sounds to me like it's going to be costly. And then you raise a question about flood insurance. If you designate this area as being a flood hazard area, will you even be able to get flood insurance? Yeah, that isn't something that we designate. That's that's FEMA. And oh. we have to comply with their maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, if you can't get flood insurance in a flood zone, you might not be able to get financing for it. Well, why wouldn't you be able to get it? That's, that's what flood insurance is for, for folks that are in a flood zone. Well, I, that, that's, that's probably true. But, you know, insurance companies, it's just like uh, uh, when there was a threat that uh, Mount Rainier was going to blow, you couldn't get earthquake insurance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well all good talking points as we continue to move this move this down the down the path any other comments on this item but is this coming to council or is this just um for our information at this point this is informational at this point it's also going to the land use committee and planning commission in the next week okay yeah, the, the final adoption of the shoreline master program is not required until June 30th. So between now and June 30th, the planning commission will conduct a public hearing and then it will be brought for council of adoption probably in the spring uh, once the rest of the work on the shoreline master program is complete. And then even after we adopt, it has to go to the Department of Ecology for final review and they approve it, I believe, right, Carrie, Correct. before it takes effect. They certify it. Right. Okay, well, although it's not on the official agenda included in our packet today was just a list of the, uh, the monthly permit app, uh, activity for September. I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at that. Seems like uh, part staying busy. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I, I think there was a ribbon cutting this Friday. Is that right, Mayor? Did you go to that on the apartment project or is it next Friday? You're muted. It's a groundbreaking, not a ribbon cutting, but yeah, okay. it's next Friday. It's I haven't I haven't been there yet. I think it's just, I think it's. I'll, I'll tell you in a second here. I, I sent okay. I forwarded to the council too. Uh, Cindy responded that she was wanted to attend. That's got to be next. Anyway, it's uh, it's coming. 
So, uh, so those permits have actually issued in October, but the five buildings for the Sedgwick multifamily next to Fred Meyer have issued. Um, you also see that the Sinclair Apartments Phase 2 building A, B, and C are in for plan review right now. Um, so a lot of this multifamily, a lot of these multifamily projects are now happening. At least one of them is under construction and three of them are in the plan review phase for development. Um, I also wanted to report that we are now um, pushing 108 homes year to date, which is more uh, about 10 more than we did in 2019. And we still have two months left. Um, so I'm, I'm expecting us to be pretty well above our, our historic numbers on single family and significantly above on multifamily because we haven't had a multifamily project since 2017. So um, we, are, we are definitely busy. That groundbreaking's this Thursday at 11 o'clock at the uh, Cedric Landing, which is next to Fred Meyer. Thank you. Great. Okay, is there any other good of the orders? Any other last comments before we adjourn today? Beck and John, or Sean, if I could just get you for two minutes afterwards, I want to talk about our calendars, <laughs> if I could. You bet. Okay. Hey, All Fred, right, everyone. Are you, <clears throat> Fred, are you, Fred, excuse me. I'm sorry, Sean. Fred, are you still using uh, Ferry Commuter as your email address? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so should I stop the recording here? Or his personal well, that, business. Um, when are we meeting again? Because we, we pushed this meeting um, to the end of November. So do we really want to have another meeting in two weeks? I would say no. Um, why don't we get back on with our with our regularly scheduled meeting in December? Does that sound right? So we'd be about six weeks out. Okay. What is that date? Just so I can put it on my calendar. That will be... The second Monday... So the 14th. Uh, yes. December 14th, 9 o'clock a.m. Okay. Or is it 9.30? Nine, yes, 9.30. 9.30, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop the recording now. Great.